We're in Acts chapter 1, but before we look there, I want you to turn to Romans chapter 8 and stand the reading of God's Word. Romans chapter 8. You still singing, Gene? I heard that. I know, amen. I want you to just look at one verse here, and then we'll jump into Acts chapter 1. Look at verse 9. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit. If the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. You are controlled by the Spirit of God who lives in you. That's good news. Father, thank you so much for the Holy Spirit. And as we began our service crying out, Lord, light the fire again, as we conclude it, Lord, and, and, and with, the, with the worship portion of, Lord, just, just light this fire, Lord, and and revive our hearts. Lord, that, is, that really is what we want. We don't want to give up on this race that you called us. We want to run strong. We want to be who you called us to be all the way. Lord, every one of us in this building want to finish well for you. But it can't happen without the power and the overflowing and the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And so help us renew ourselves and find new ways to yield to the controlling influence of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn around and say to one another, if you're controlled, you'll be transformed. Go ahead, would you please? All right, then you got your Bibles open up to Acts chapter 1, and uh, we're going to look, we're going to continue on. Now, according to that verse of Scripture we just read in Romans 8 9, one of the greatest evidences that the Holy Spirit is dwelling in us is that He has a controlling influence in our lives. Amen? And by His controlling influence, He transforms us to be the kind of people that God has called us to be. Brothers and sisters, we cannot make ourselves that way. We cannot try harder. We cannot um, um, be, you know, more, study harder. We cannot cannot become only the Holy Spirit, and his power causes us to be what God wants us to be. What we can do is yield, and what we can do is trust. Amen? Amen. Amen, amen, and cooperate with everything he's doing. Well, one of the great examples of how the Holy Spirit, when his controlling influence is transforming people's lives, one of the greatest examples of this is seen in the disciples of Jesus. Um, You know, we're going through the book of Mark and on Wednesday nights, and something that we've noticed with them, they loved Jesus, these disciples loved Jesus, but there was constantly a struggle in their life with their faith, a constant struggle in their life with their flesh, a constant struggle in, the, in their life with their obedience. But something amazing happened. When they received the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, in their lives on the night of of Jesus' resurrection, they became transformed. In our text today, in Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through, oh, what, 26, we're, we're going to see three major ways that these disciples were transformed in less than 30 days. And it's amazing. So we're going to kind of survey, and we're going to look at, are you up for the task? Let's, let's look at how and where they were transformed. Amen? 
Okay, so let's pick it up uh, at, verse, at verse 8. Well, actually, look at verse 4 real fast. Okay, you remember we talked about this? On one occasion, Jesus had already r- rose from the dead. He's been meeting with them over a period of 40 days. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. Okay, so what was the command? The command was for them to what? Not leave Jerusalem and to wait for the gift, right? And so then they were asking, are you going to restore at this time? And, and Jesus says, it's not, time, it's not for you to know the times and places, but verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now let's pick it up at verse 9. After he said this, He was taken up before their eyes, their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. By the way, does the text say how fast he was taken up? No. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Let me ask you something. Did did they see Jesus go up into heaven on a horse? See, we usually think this means the, the, what's traditionally called the second coming. But if you read Revelation chapter 19, we'll talk a whole lot about that tonight and If you read Revelation chapter 19, Jesus, when he comes back to earth and and rules in his Davidic kingdom for a thousand years, he's coming back on a horse. So the question we have to ask then is, what is this coming? Certainly it isn't the premillennial coming. Well, I'm not going to say any more. You have to come tonight. We'll talk about it. (laughs) Six o'clock, by the way. Then look at, look at verse 12. Then they returned to where? They returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's work from the city. What? Did I say it wrong? A Sabbath day's walk from the city. Sorry. Look at verse 12 again. What did Jesus tell them to do in verse 4? Don't leave Jerusalem. They were on the Mount of Olives. They saw Jesus go. So what did they do? They went back to Jerusalem. Now this doesn't seem like a big deal. But I want to show you something. It is, it's really big. The Holy Spirit transformed these disciples to obedience. He did. There was a time when Jesus said, I want you to meet me here in, at this place, and half of his disciples decided to go fishing instead. After seeing Jesus ascend uh, and being told by God's messengers that the Lord will come back in the same manner, that they, these disciples immediately obeyed the Lord's command by returning back to Jerusalem and waiting. Now, These are the same disciples who 30 days before this fell away and abandoned the Lord when he was arrested. These were the same disciples not long before this that when Jesus said, I'll meet you here, they went fishing over there. So what made the difference? Now they're perfectly obeying God's commands. What made the difference? Well, the indwelling Holy Spirit is, by the way, what the Bible calls the sanctifying spirit. Would you read 2 Thessalonians 2.13 with me? But we ought always to thank God for you, brothers, loved by the Lord, because from the beginning God chose you 
to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit and through belief in truth. They were transformed to obedience by the Holy Spirit in their life. And it's because the Holy Spirit, by the way, happens to be the sanctifying spirit. Now that word saint, sanctified, and holy, it's all the same word in the Greek. And it just means set aside for God's presence and set aside for God's purposes. But how could anybody be set aside for God's purposes if they're disobeying him? Right? The, 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 there is a, this, this, this influence, this, this, um, this controlling influence of the Holy Spirit. One of the things he does in our lives is he influences us unto obedience. This is what the Holy Spirit is always drawing us and always, always leading us and always gently moving us in. It's always obedience to the Lord and to his commands. It really is. I, I just talked to one of our precious sisters this week, and, and she was going through just a heartbreaking um, situation, and she just wanted to just abandon everything and just run from it. It, it, was, just, it was just heartbreaking for her. But, but the Bible doesn't say to run from those things. The Bible says face those things. The Bible doesn't say just avoid them forever. In fact, my word to her from, that I felt like came from the Lord was, you run from that, you will be in the same situation with, with different people until you learn to face this, until you learn how to be obedient to it, and you learn, and then showed her some verses of Scripture that, that basically says, you be a blessing in the midst of your suffering. Instead of run from them, bless them. Immediately, her heart turns and says, I want to obey this. It wasn't something she was saying, well, I know I better obey this and I'll get around to it. The Holy Spirit, his controlling influence in her life switched on that gear and just and and she felt him and knew him and just said I need to do this I need to be this and and so talking to her I said now you realize it's not going to be all puppy dogs and butterflies in obeying him you realize that we Christians are called to suffering don't hear a lot of that do we but it's really the truth read first Peter and she says, you know, I, I do. I know. I realize exactly what I'm going to be facing. I said, you still want to obey? You bet. That's the controlling Holy Spirit in her life, influencing her, leading her, prompting her to obedience. Brothers and sisters, so... To the degree we continue to yield to his controlling influence in our lives, that's the degree that we'll be obedient to the Lord. Some of you struggling with obedience? It's not that you can't. It's that you need to yield. Because that's what the Holy Spirit is always drawing you to. Sense him. That's what he's promoting. That's what he's doing in our lives. Amen? Okay. So now, look, look at verse 13 and 14. It, 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 they continue to be transformed. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon, the zealot, and Judas, not Judas Iscariot, but Judas, the son of James. Read verse 14, um, I mean verse, um, yeah, 14 with me, would you please? They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. By the way, that's a transformation in and of itself because it wasn't too many months before this that they were that Mary and his brothers, James and Jude, 
said he's crazy and they were trying to take him by force. But now, get, get this, they're together. And what were they all doing together according to verse 14? They're praying, and how much are they praying? The Holy Spirit transformed them into intercessors. You know, throughout the book of Acts, we're going to find that a regular practice of the followers of Jesus was that they prayed together. And every time corporate prayer was recorded in Acts, God did something powerful in it. It's a great, just do a little survey, just do a little study. Every time the church got together and prayed together, look what happens. It's amazing. Again, what is, what is amazing about this transformation, uh, you know, it, it, into these disciples being now intercessors, praying all the time, was just 30 or so days before this, remember, they could not even tarry one hour in prayer when Jesus needed them to. He was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he asked them, guys, I just need you to pray. And they couldn't. They couldn't. In fact, he went back a couple of times. Guys, come on. That's when he said, you know, but we're just so tired. You know, we just did communion, man. We're we're, we're full from the lamb, (laughs) you know. We just took a walk, and now you're praying, and Lord, we just don't understand, and you told us all this stuff, and we're just, you know, and Jesus said, you know, the, the spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak. Wow. We never have a problem with our spirit. We have a problem with our flesh. Amen? Amen. And Satan doesn't need to invent demonic things. Very rarely will you get a direct assault from Satan. Very rare. What he will do is capitalize on your flesh because he knows how good that works. He'll whisper things to you and all that stuff. But but how was it that they, they were transformed to be an intercessors. Because the indwelling Holy Spirit is the interceding spirit in our lives. If we have his controlling influence, how can he who prays not help but be directed and pulled and be moved to prayer? Um, read with me what Romans 8.27 says about the Holy Spirit. And he, this is God Almighty, who searches our hearts, knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. See that word intercedes? It's interceding all the time. You wonder what the Holy Spirit is doing inside of you? One of the things he's doing inside of you, part of his controlling influence, is he's constantly praying. He's praying for you, but he wants you to be praying for other people. And, and, and you can't help. The more you yield to the Holy Spirit, he just naturally draws you to prayer. You can't help it. We have to resist him to be prayerless. We do. And we, too, are being transformed to be intercessors by the same interceding spirit. To what degree are we transformed? To the degree we continue to yield to his controlling influence in our lives. This was years and years ago, and I I forgot what her name was, honey. She was your neighbor. She was about 80-something, got saved, came to church here. She's the one when we baptized her, her hair floated up there. We didn't know she had a wig. (laughs) Yes. Okay, yeah, it was her. Anyway, it was that was by the way, that was just really awkward. <laughs> went down, she went down, and her hair stayed up. And I thought this is embarrassing. <laughs> so I tried to pick her up and try to catch it all up in line and I got her up there and she was <laughs> And her husband comes walking in front of church, every, comes walking up in front of the church and everything with a brown paper bag and said, here, let me have this, and took the wig on, kaplock, and walked down there. <laughs> oh, special new life moments. <laughs> she, she got saved. She got soundly saved. But she was well in her 80s, and she had the most difficult time praying. 
And she, she, first of all, she didn't know what the right words were. I said, you don't have to worry about the right words. Praying is just communicating with the Father. Try that. And she says, I know I need to. She already had the Holy Spirit drawing her. It was an issue in her life. She knew she needed to pray. She was being drawn to prayer. I said, she says, but I said, what's your big issue? She says, I, 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 it, feels dis, it feels phony for me to talk to someone I can't see. You, could, you, you, you understand that. You could get that, right? I said, well, I, I understand that. And I said, honey, I'll tell you what. Do you ever talk to your kids on the phone? Well, yeah. Do you see them? No. I said, prayer is like talking to God on the phone. You know it's them. You recognize it's them. You don't see them, but you talk to them. That impressed her. And I don't know how she got that example as a pastoral command. But she went and got herself a used phone, didn't plug it in, and put it next to her bed. And every time she prayed to God, she picked up the receiver and put it in her ear, and she just started talking to the Lord. And she just kept doing that till she went home to heaven. Is that precious? Is that precious? Well, uh, and my my big great pastoral mind was, hey, if it works, don't mess it up, man. <laughs> She's talking to the Lord. I think I did ask her one time, do you ever hear a real voice coming back on? <laughs> no. um, but here's the point. The Holy Spirit, his controlling influence in our life, he controls according to his own nature and his own ministry and what he does. He's the sanctifying spirit, so he sanctifies us to obedience. He's the interceding spirit, so he, 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 he moves us to prayer all the time. Think about it. Obedience and prayer. But there's something else that the Holy Spirit transforms us to and transformed these disciples in less than 30 days. Okay, ready? Let's pick up this... this Verse 15. So in those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120, and said, Brothers, the scriptures had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through the mouth of David concerning Judas, who had served as a guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our ministry. By the way, let me just stop and say, I'm glad 120 was there, but my question is, is why, hasn't, why wasn't there over 500 there? Because it says in 1 Corinthians 15, Jesus appeared to over 500 people. Right? But these believers, here's 120, so praise God. So, verse 16 again, sorry about that. I just had to be, be a little preachy on you said, brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through the mouth of David concerning Judas, who served as a guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number and shared in this ministry. With the reward he got for his wickedness, Judas bought a field. There he fell headlong, and his body burst open, and all of his intestines spelled out. Ooh, gruesome. Everyone in Jerusalem heard about this, and so they called the field in their language, Akledamach, that is, filled of blood. And by the way, um, it was filled of blood not just because of, of what happened to his intestines spilling out there, but it was bought with blood money, and that's, that's why it was called that. For, for, said Peter, it is written in the book of Psalms, May his place be deserted, let no, one, um, to dwell, let no one to dwell in it, and, in another psalm, may another take his place of leadership. Therefore, it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus went, out, went in and out among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us, for one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they proposed two men, Joseph called um, 
Barsabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over this apostolic ministry, which Judas left to go to where he belongs. Then they cast lots, and the lot fell to Matthias. So he was added to the 11 apostles. All right. This is what's so amazing. The Holy Spirit transformed them to being Bible believers, Bible followers. Do you see this perspective Peter had? See this perspective that whole group had? The Holy Spirit transformed them to do stuff according to the Bible. First of all, look at verse 16 again. They understood the origin of scriptures. The Holy Spirit spoke through Dave. Right? Look, look what happens. Then they, they took a biblical view of what happened to Judas. Right? Instead of letting themselves just be there and, and just complain and this and that and the other thing, they said, you know what? The best thing we need to do is see what God has already said about this event. And they did. And they let Scripture speak to them. Scripture mold their understanding. And then they took a biblical view of what to do with the vacancy of the apostle. Well, it says in Psalms, another needs to take his place. We need to act on that. This is amazing. And then they, they, they took an approach of selecting the new apostle according to a biblical principle established in Proverbs 16.33. I used to read this, and I used to say, man, they're doing good. They're obeying the Bible. They're hearing the Bible. They're getting a Bible perspective. Now they're responding to the word of God. What are they doing? Throwing dice. They pray, Lord, you know, you know everyone's heart, and then they cast lots. Well, they understood something else the Bible said. Keep your finger here, would you? And go to Proverbs chapter 13. I'm sorry, 16. The very last verse. Proverbs 16, 33. Look what it says, just in case you're thinking that now they're acting in the flesh. They weren't. They had two very good options. They wanted to know, Lord, which one? Who do you want? Because they don't select those apostles. Jesus selects the apostles, right? And so they did something according to the word of God. Are you there? Look at verse 33. The lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. By the way, it's not a bad idea if you have uh, the option between two very good things and you go, God, each one of them are very, very good. Lord, you know which one's right. And listen, as a result, if you're basing it on on this verse, and God knows everything, instead of saying, well, I'll try this one, and if it doesn't work, then I'll go to the next one. Why don't you just say, Lord, I've got a, I've got a white dice, and I've got a you know, black dice, I mean, and, and, and I'm just going to put them in a little box, and I'm going to roll around and, and not see what it is. And Lord, if it's black, I'll go over here. If it's white, I'll go over here. And then you just let one come out. And why not do it? if there are two good options, and if you're asking the Lord. Now, we don't always have two very good options. <laughs> but the point is, okay, go back to Acts. The point is this. These guys were obeying everything according to Scripture at this point in time. This is amazing because just 30 or so days before this, they were arguing with each other again for the third time right after the Lord's Supper about who was the greatest. Three times, twice when they argued, Jesus brought them the word of God about that kind of attitude. 
Twice they heard it from the Lord. And here the Lord, you know, remember the night of communion. Jesus just got finished washing his disciples' feet. Took the position of a servant. He had already told them over and over again, if you want to be great in God's kingdom, you must be the servant of all. Don't try to lord over the, you know, he's already told them these things from the word of God. And here they are, 30 or so days before this, here they are, after having their feet washed, after having communion, having Jesus say, by the way, this cup, it's my, this cup of thanksgiving, it's the blood of my new covenant. And this piece of bread that they picked up, they never understood why, that they're, this is my body broken for you. I mean, such revelation that was going on. And then afterwards, and in fact it says, and they sung a hymn. And then after having, what an amazing church service, they all start arguing who's the greatest again. Oh, that is so us. That is so us. But they were transformed by the Holy Spirit, the indwelling Holy Spirit, and, and, and his controlling influence in their life transform them to be Bible believers, Bible followers. So you're not a believer if you're not doing what it says. If you say, well, I believe this, but you ignore it and you're not applying your life, you, you ain't a believer, I'm just telling you. Bible believer is a Bible doer. Amen? And they were Bible doers, and this is amazing. Why is that? Because the indwelling Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. Read John 16, 13, the first part, would you? But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. Well, well what's the all the truth that he guides you into? Well, just the truth about whether I should vote Republican or Democrat. Uh, no. No. There's, by the way, there's as many genuine Christians that feel the Holy Spirit wants them to vote that way and the other ones should vote that way, and let's not even get there. The truth is this. Jesus said the next chapter after this one when he's talking to the Father, sanctify them, O God, by your truth. Thy word, your word, word is truth. The Holy Spirit, his indwelling, controlling influence is always one of truth. It's always compelling us. And to what degree then are we transformed the same, in the same way? To the degree that we're yielding to the Holy Spirit. Now I want you to think about this. They were transformed to obedience. They were transformed to prayer life, to prayer. They were transformed to being Bible doers, Bible believers. What three places in our life get attacked the most? Obeying him, praying, and getting in our word. Obeying him, praying, and getting into the word. Right? Do you think there's a reason for that? Because the enemy knows if we will resist this Holy Spirit who naturally is constantly moving us there, that we will grieve him. And then once we grieve the Holy Spirit, it's no longer about the Holy Spirit doing things through us. It's now the Holy Spirit has to stop and redo things in us. Oh, he knows the Holy Spirit will win because the Holy Spirit always wins. But if he could slow down and hinder the process, if he could keep your fruitfulness down, this is, this is just wisdom. Brothers and sisters, when we're yielding to the controlling influences of the indwelling Holy Spirit, 
we are naturally, constantly being drawn to obedience. Naturally, constantly being drawn to prayer. Naturally, constantly being drawn to, to doing what the Word of God says. Perspective, according to the Word. A whole biblical paradigm becomes our life. These guys were transformed. And you and I. This, by the way, is only 30 or so days. So, Pastor, then what's the matter with me? I've been saved for 50 years now, or whatever. Uh, nothing's wrong with you except the fact that sometimes you become desensitized to the presence and the person of the Holy Spirit in your lives, and you stop yielding to him. That's all. You stop letting his voice be the dominant voice that it once was in your life. His pull, his tug, his being the, wow, this is, this is my marching orders. And now you, we, we go from, this is my marching orders, I got to do this, to, wow, these are good suggestions, to, well, I got time. Maybe that's, maybe not. It happens to all of us. Light the fire again, Lord. Because this is what the Holy Spirit is always promoting. It's his nature. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. How did I do? Good. Let's bow our hearts before him. Father God, your solution for our flesh is the Holy Spirit. It's not only the forgiveness and the blood of Jesus and the cross, but it is the wonderful, controlling influence, being spirit-controlled. Father God, you have, you have given us such a wonderful, wonderful gift of Jesus. And Jesus, all that you've accomplished becomes our experience by the presence of the Holy Spirit. We keep crying out for being to be transformed and then walk away and do our own thing. Lord, transformation is already ours as we yield to his presence, to the Holy Spirit's presence, to his leadership, to his nature in our own life. For Holy Spirit, I know you're always compelling us to obedience, always compelling us to prayerfulness, always compelling us to being Bible doers. But we want to ask you to forgive us for what was once so powerfully our marching orders we turned them into suggestions. We became desensitized. And what was then suggestions, we just turned them into whatever. And we start doing our own thing. I, I kind of feel like I know then why Paul said what he said to the Galatians. After you beginning with the Spirit, are you now trying to accomplish your goals through your flesh? Father, forgive us. Forgive us. Restore us back to our first love. Restore us back to that sensitivity we had at the very beginning. Holy Spirit, you're still in us. You don't change. You're in us. But restore our hearts. Whatever has become calloused or worn down or whatever, Lord, just remove that, I pray, in Jesus' name. Help us as a church and as individuals, Lord. Really, really follow and yield to your control. For that's what you're doing inside of us. That has never stopped. We love you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Stan, would you please?